In light of current events, as well as past and possible future coverage of Supreme Court involvement in this case, today I'll begin reading U.S. District Court Judge Tanya S. Chutkin's original memorandum opinion denying Donald Trump's motion to dismiss the charges against him in the January 6th case, based on claims of presidential immunity and constitutional grounds. Trump appealed this decision to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, who heard arguments in the case. If you're interested in listening to those arguments, I've attached a C-SPAN link in the episode description, which includes audio as well as the transcript. Over the past month, I've received dozens of requests to read this document, and I was going to wait until I was back home to read it, but since the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments in the appeal today, I've decided to go ahead and read it from my hotel room. As with the last couple of episodes, though, the sound quality might not be the best, but I wanted to make it available to you as soon as possible. And now I give you U.S. District Court Judge Tanya S. Chutkin's December 1, 2023 Memorandum Opinion denying Donald Trump's motion to dismiss the charges against him in United States v. Donald Trump. Enjoy. The United States has charged former President Donald J. Trump with four counts of criminal conduct that he allegedly committed during the waning days of his presidency. He has moved to dismiss the charges against him based on presidential immunity and on constitutional grounds. For the reasons set forth below, the court will deny both motions. Part 1 Background At the motion to dismiss stage, the court assumes the truth of the indictment's allegations. Defendant contends that the charges in the indictment are based on his public statements and tweets about the federal election and certification, communications with the U.S. Department of Justice about investigating elections crimes and possibly appointing a new acting attorney general, communications with state officials about the federal election and the exercise of their official duties with respect to the election, communications with the Vice President and members of Congress about the exercise of their official duties in the election certification proceedings, and organizing slates of electors as part of the attempt to convince legislators not to certify the election against defendant. Those generalized descriptions fail to properly portray the conduct with which he has been charged. Accordingly, the court will briefly review the central allegations as set forth in the indictment. Defendant was the 45th President of the United States and a candidate for re-election in 2020. Despite having lost that election, he was determined to remain in power. So for more than two months following Election Day on November 3, 2020, the defendant spread lies that there had been outcome-determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. He knew that those claims were false, but repeatedly and widely disseminated them anyway to make his knowingly false claims appear legitimate, create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger, and erode public faith in the administration of the election. In fact, the defendant was notified repeatedly that his claims were untrue, often by the people on whom he relied for candid advice on important matters, and who were best positioned to know the facts, and he deliberately disregarded the truth. Those people included the vice president, senior leaders of the Justice Department, the director of national intelligence, the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, senior White House attorneys, senior staffers on the defendant's 2020 re-election campaign, state legislators and officials, and state and federal judges. 
Defendant also pursued unlawful means of discounting legitimate votes and subverting the election results. Specifically, he targeted a bedrock function of the United States federal government, the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. The indictment describes that process. The Constitution provided that individuals called electors select the president and that each state determined for itself how to appoint the electors apportioned to it. Through state laws, each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia chose to select their electors based on the popular vote in the state. After Election Day, the Electoral Count Act, or ECA, required each state to formally determine or ascertain, the electors who would represent the state's voters by casting electoral votes on behalf of the candidate who had won the popular vote, and required the executive of each state to certify to the federal government the identities of those electors. Then, on a date set by the ECA, each state's ascertained electors were required to meet and collect the results of the presidential election. That is, to cast electoral votes based on their state's popular vote and to send their electoral votes, along with the state executive's certification that they were the state's legitimate electors, to the United States Congress to be counted and certified in an official proceeding. Finally, the Constitution and ECA required that on the sixth day of January following Election Day, the Congress meet in a joint session for a certification proceeding, presided over by the Vice President as the President of the Senate, to count the electoral votes, resolve any objections, and announce the result, thus certifying the winner of the presidential election as President-elect. Defendant along with at least six co-conspirators, undertook efforts to impair, obstruct, and defeat that process through dishonesty, fraud, and deceit. Those efforts took five alleged forms. First, they used knowingly false claims of election fraud to get state legislators and election officials to subvert the legitimate election results and change electoral votes for the defendant's opponent, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., to electoral votes for the defendant. That is, on the pretext of baseless fraud claims, the defendant pushed officials in certain states to ignore the popular vote, disenfranchise millions of voters, dismiss legitimate electors, and ultimately cause the ascertainment of, and voting by, illegitimate electors, in favor of the defendant. Second, they organized fraudulent slates of electors in seven targeted states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, attempting to mimic the procedures that the legitimate electors were supposed to follow under the Constitution and other federal and state laws. This included causing the fraudulent electors to meet on the day appointed by federal law on which legitimate electors were to gather and cast their votes, cast fraudulent votes for the defendant, and sign certificates falsely representing that they were legitimate electors. They then caused these fraudulent electors to transmit their false certificates to the vice president and other government officials to be counted at the certification proceeding on January 6, 2021. Third, they attempted to use the power and authority of the Justice Department to conduct sham election crime investigations and to send a letter to the targeted states that falsely claimed that the Justice Department had identified significant concerns that may have impacted the election outcome that sought to advance the defendant's fraudulent elector plan by using the Justice Department's authority to falsely present the fraudulent electors 
as a valid alternative to the legitimate electors, and that urged, on behalf of the Justice Department, the targeted states' legislatures to convene to create the opportunity to choose the fraudulent electors over the legitimate electors. Fourth, using knowingly false claims of election fraud, they attempted to convince the vice president to use the defendant's fraudulent electors, reject legitimate electoral votes, or send legitimate electoral votes to state legislatures for review rather than counting them. When that failed, on the morning of January 6th, they repeated knowingly false claims of election fraud to gathered supporters, falsely told them that the vice president had the authority to, and might, alter the election results, and directed them to the Capitol to obstruct the certification proceeding and exert pressure on the vice president to take the fraudulent actions he had previously refused. Fifth, on the afternoon of January 6th, once a large and angry crowd, including many individuals whom the defendant had deceived into believing the vice president could and might change the election results, violently attacked the Capitol and halted the proceeding. They exploited the disruption by redoubling efforts to levy false claims of election fraud and convince members of Congress to further delay the certification based on those claims. Based on this conduct, the indictment charges defendant with four counts. Conspiracy to defraud the United States in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 371, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 1512K, obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding in violation of 18 U.S.C. Sections 1512C2, and conspiracy against rights in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 241. Part 2. Legal Standard A criminal defendant may move to dismiss based on a defect in the indictment, such as a failure to state an offense. That motion may be based, as it is here, on constitutional challenges to the prosecution, including the assertion of immunity. Because a court's use of its supervisory power to dismiss an indictment directly encroaches upon the fundamental role of the grand jury, dismissal is granted only in unusual circumstances. Part 3. Executive Immunity Defendant contends that the Constitution grants him absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions performed within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility while he served as President of the United States, so long as he was not both impeached and convicted for those actions. The Constitution's text, structure, and history do not support that contention. No court or any other branch of government has ever accepted it, and this court will not so hold. Whatever immunities a sitting president may enjoy, the United States has only one chief executive at a time, and that position does not confer a lifelong get-out-of-jail-free pass. Former presidents enjoy no special conditions on their federal criminal liability. Defendant may be subject to federal investigation indictment, prosecution, conviction, and punishment for any criminal acts undertaken while in office. A. Text In interpreting the Constitution, courts ordinarily begin with its text, but there is no provision in the Constitution conferring the immunity that defendant claims. 
the Supreme Court has already noted the absence of explicit constitutional guidance on whether a president possesses any immunity. The executive branch has likewise recognized that the Constitution provides no explicit immunity from criminal sanctions for any civil officer, including the current president. There is no presidential immunity clause. The lack of constitutional text is no accident. The framers explicitly created immunity for other officials. The Constitution's Speech and Debate Clause provides that senators and representatives shall in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses, and in going to and returning from the same, and for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. And some founding-era state constitutions like those of Virginia and Delaware unequivocally protected their governor from certain penal sanctions, at least until he was out of office. The U.S. Constitution contains no equivalent protections for the president. Nor is the Constitution silent on the question because its drafters and ratifiers assumed the president would enjoy the immunity defendant claims. To the contrary, America's founding generation envisioned a chief executive wholly different from the unaccountable, almost omnipotent rulers of other nations at that time. In Federalist No. 69, titled The Real Character of the Executive, Alexander Hamilton emphasized the total dissimilitude between the President and the King of Great Britain, the latter being sacred and inviolable in that there is no constitutional tribunal to which he is amenable, no punishment to which he can be subjected. Hamilton's contemporary commentators universally affirmed the crucial distinction that the president would at some point be subject to criminal process. That widely acknowledged contrast between the president and a king is even more compelling for a former president. The Constitution's silence on former president's criminal immunity thus does not reflect an understanding that such immunity existed. Lacking an express constitutional provision, defendant hangs his textual argument for immunity on the Impeachment Judgment Clause, U.S. Constitution Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7, but it cannot bear the weight he places on it. The clause provides, Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. From this language, defendant concludes that the president may be charged by indictment only in cases where the president has been impeached and convicted by trial in the Senate. But defendant is not president, and reading the clause to grant absolute criminal immunity to former presidents would contravene its plain meaning, original understanding, and common sense. The clause has two parts. The first limits the penalties of impeachment to removal and disqualification from office. That limit marked a deliberate departure from the prevailing British tradition, in which an impeachment conviction might result in a wide array of criminal penalties, including fines, imprisonment, and even execution. The second part of the clause provides, however, that impeachment's limits do not preclude the party convicted from later criminal prosecution in the courts, i.e., that further punishment would still be available, but simply not to the legislature. Both parts of the clause undercut defendants' interpretation of it. The first begins by defining the clause's scope. 
judgment in cases of impeachment, indicating that the clause is aimed primarily at identifying the permissible penalties associated with impeachment itself. The clause's second part confirms that purview. Rather than stating that the party convicted shall only then be liable to criminal prosecution, the clause states that the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable. At the founding, as now, nevertheless meant notwithstanding that, and notwithstanding that meant without hindrance or obstruction from. In the impeachment judgment clause, the word nevertheless in the second part thus signifies that the first part, constraining impeachment's penalties, does not bear on whether the party would also be subject to criminal prosecution. As discussed at greater length below, the clause's manifest purpose and originally understood effect was therefore to permit criminal prosecution in spite of the prior adjudication by the Senate, i.e. to forestall a double jeopardy argument. That is quite different from establishing impeachment and conviction as a prerequisite to a former president's criminal prosecution. The historical sources that defendant cites do not move the needle. First, he quotes Alexander Hamilton's twin statements in The Federalist that the President of the United States would be liable to be impeached, tried, and, upon conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes or misdemeanors, removed from office, and would afterwards be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of law and that the president would be at all times liable to impeachment, trial, dismission from office, incapacity to serve in any other, and to forfeiture of life and estate by subsequent prosecution in the common course of law. But those statements merely echo the clause's clarification that prosecution may follow impeachment, they do not say that those events must happen in that order. Second, defendant cites Founding Father James Wilson's remark during the ratification debates that the president is amenable to the laws in his private character as a citizen and in his public character by impeachment. But Wilson was describing a president in office and that description is entirely consistent with the former president, having returned to life as a citizen, being subject to criminal prosecution. There is no evidence that any of the Constitution's drafters or ratifiers intended or understood former presidents to be criminally immune unless they had been impeached and convicted, much less a widespread consensus that the impeachment judgment clause would have that effect. In addition to lacking textual or historical support, defendants' interpretation of the clause collapses under application of common sense. For one, his reasoning is based on the logical fallacy of denying the antecedent. From the statement, if the animal is a cat, it can be a pet, it does not follow that if the animal is not a cat, it cannot be a pet. Yet defendant argues that because a president who is impeached and convicted may be subject to criminal prosecution, a president who is not convicted may not be subject to criminal prosecution. Even assuming that negative implication finds some traction when applied to sitting presidents, the logic certainly does not hold for former presidents. That is because there is another way, besides impeachment and conviction, for a president to be removed from office and thus subjected to the ordinary course of law. As in defendant's case, he may be voted out. The president shall hold his office during the term of four years. 
Without re-election, the expiration of that term ends a presidency as surely as impeachment and conviction. Nothing in the Impeachment Judgment Clause prevents criminal prosecution thereafter. Defendant's reading of the Impeachment Judgment Clause also proves too much. If the clause required impeachment and conviction to precede criminal prosecution, then that requirement would apply not only to the president, but also to the vice president and all civil officers of the United States, who may likewise be impeached. The constitutional practice since the founding, however, has been to prosecute and even imprison civil officers other than the president prior to their impeachment. For instance, then-Vice President Aaron Burr was indicted without being impeached, and the same fate might have befallen Vice President Spiro Agnew had he not resigned and entered a nolo contendere plea. Not only would defendants' interpretation contradict that long-settled practice, it would also introduce significant complications into criminal proceedings for all current and former federal officials, including threshold constitutional questions of whether the suspect is or was an officer of the United States, and whether the offense is one for which he could be impeached. The clash with historical practice and difficulties in application that would flow from defendants' interpretation further confirm that it cannot be the correct reading of the clause. Finally, defendants' interpretation of the impeachment judgment clause would produce implausibly perverse results. The Constitution permits impeachment and conviction for a limited category of offenses, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Under defendants' reading, if a president commits a crime that does not fall within that limited category and so could not be impeached and convicted, the president could never be prosecuted for that crime. Alternatively, if Congress does not have the opportunity to impeach or convict a sitting president, perhaps because the crime occurred near the end of their term or is covered up until after the president has left office, the former president similarly could not be prosecuted. Defendant seems to suggest that this scenario in which the former president would be utterly unaccountable for their crimes is simply the price we pay for the separation of powers. That cannot be the clause's meaning. The constitutional limits on impeachment's penalties do not license a president's criminal impunity. In sum, nothing in the Constitution's text supplies the immunity that defendant claims. To be sure, a specific textual basis has not been considered a prerequisite to the recognition of immunity, and so the inquiry is not confined to the express terms of our founding charter. But the lack of supporting constitutional text does mean that a former president's federal criminal immunity, if it exists, must arise entirely from concerns of public policy, especially as illuminated by our history and the structure of our government. Defendants' resort to those principles fares no better. We've come to the end of part one of this opinion, but don't worry, next episode we will pick up right where this episode left off. Until then, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.